Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Are you living the life that God has commanded you to live? Now, many times people, they come to faith and they believe that that gives them a new position, a new opportunity, and that is to give power to their prayer so that what they want, what they ask for, God will do. And this is not what the Bible reveals. What the scripture reveals is this, that you have been saved by grace. It is a free gift. God has been merciful to you. He has forgiven you. He has caused you to become a new creation. And one of the primary purposes that you are in this world at this time, rather than in the kingdom of heaven, it is for you to serve God, to do the things that he expects you to do. And it's only when we are walking in the love of God, not some definition of love that the world has, but the definition that God has for love. And when we look at the scripture, we find that love is a sacrificial word. Love involves giving, giving of yourself in order to be a godly, a righteous, a kingdom influence upon someone else. So let me ask you that same question. Are you living correctly? Are you doing the things that God would have you to do? Or are you wanting to live in this world according to what you feel is right for you, what is pleasing to you? These two things are vastly different. My will and the will of God. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to John's first epistle, 1 John and chapter 4. Now, this is a very important chapter. We're going to see that John is going to be speaking about the Antichrist, spiritual things, unclean spirits, and those things which are in opposition to the will of God. And God wants us to know the truth. Why? So that we are liberated from sin in order to do His will. Freedom and liberty in the Bible is always for the will of God. That I can be set free, liberated from the influence of sin in my life in order that I can do the purposes of God. And it's in God's will doing his purposes where there is joy, where there is intimacy with God, where there is a spirit of joy that is going to give to you a contentment, a peace, a satisfaction that the world does not understand and cannot experience. So let's look at chapter 4 of this first epistle of John. He writes here, Beloved ones. Now, he's going to emphasize love, the love of God in this passage. And he wants to know that true disciples, those all who have received that gospel message, are beloved by God. And therefore, he says, and he gives us instructions, a warning. And this is big. It is huge. We need to listen attentively and be ready to implement this wisdom, the wisdom of the text, into our life, where he says, not every spirit you believe. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, when he says spirit, See, in this world with human eyes, we don't see the unclean spirits. We don't see those those demons. But you know what we can see? Their activity. And when it talks about do not believe every spirit, don't think 
that every supernatural thing, everything that's extraordinary or out of the ordinary, that this is of God. There is that which is of God, and that is there is also that which is of the enemy, unclean spirits, demonic in origin. So he warns us, don't believe every spirit. Don't think that everything that's supernatural, this is of God, that God's at work here. In fact, I want to share with you a, a principle, and then we'll see how I arrived at that principle. It's not my own. It's what the scripture, I believe, reveals to us. And that's this. Here's the principle. Most supernatural activity today, most things which are spiritual are not from God. In fact, it is seldom that we see and recognize that which is of God. We, when we're mature, we can discern this is of God. This is of God. But His activity, it is rare. It's seldom perceived by most individuals, even by most believers. It's those that are mature in the faith, and have have committed themselves fully over to the things of God that are going to have, and here's this word, discernment. Most believers do not have spiritual discernment. Why? Because they're not committed to the things of God. So he says here, not every spirit you believe, but do what? He says, but, and this means, but rather, Here's what we should do. He says, test the spirits. Now, this is the Greek word, dokumezo, where we get the English word to document. Oftentimes, it's translated with the word to prove something. And it's related to discernment in the sense. When we prove, we discern the origin of something. Whether this is good of God or whether it's evil and of the enemy so every believer is called to have this discernment again it is seldom displayed people are not committed to the things as they need to be now people hear then they say well well that's a judgmental statement no you're not hearing it correctly it is a warning it is a word of encouragement to take seriously the fact that spiritual growth just doesn't happen it is something that comes about because one is committed to the truth of God in God's Word and what we find today is that among the body of believers those things that are not of God those things that are not scripturally sound are the popular things you will find that when there is an individual that is speaking truth and there are many godly men that are speaking the word of God. But here's the problem. You will find that more often than not, not always, but but the majority time, when you see a, a stadium that is full or some place where there's just thousands of people, you will find that more often than not, that one who's teaching has serious doctrinal problems. Their theological views are not accurate. And many times they emphasize the supernatural, signs and wonders. I'm not against signs and wonders, but they need to be that which is rooted in the movement of the Holy Spirit. And what we see here, pay close attention. He says, don't you believe every spirit, every manifestation of the spirit that it's of God. But he says, and it's a command. He says, you test, you document the spirit. If from God, it is. Now, it's interesting because spirits are in the plural. But then when he says document the spirits, he says to see if it is, he is of God. Now, it goes from plural to singular. Why is that? Because we need to check out every one. Not just generally speaking, but everyone. And how do we do that? Well, in a few minutes, he's going to teach us that.
But notice what he says in this next part. Now, I want to give you a, a principle. I alluded to it earlier, and that is this. Most of the spiritual manifestations are not of God. I said that a true spiritual manifestation, it is rare, it happens, but it's rare. And it's seldom perceived properly by the vast majority of the world, obviously, but also by, by the majority of people who are indeed believers. Why? Because there is an absence of spiritual discernment today. I'm amazed of the number of things that just just people say, put forth, and people clap, they agree with, they think it's fine, and so frequently. Not only is it problematic according to Scripture, but oftentimes it is heresy. People are not attentive to what the Word of God says, and I'll give you some examples later on but notice what he says here's why i say it's rare and those that are of demonic and unclean spirit is much more prevalent because he says look at the second part of verse one word writes because many false prophets have gone out this verb in its tense means have gone out in the past are going out now at this present time and will continue to go out he says many false prophets have gone out into the world now notice what he's done in this first verse he's talked about spirits that are not of god therefore unclean spirits of demonic of satanic origin and he's linked this with false teachers there's no other way to understand this verse 1 links spiritual manifestations with false prophets it is very very important that we see this and he says there are many false prophets and a true prophet he is rare a true prophet is always going to base what he says accurately on scriptural revelation false prophets they will twist the scriptures they will take scriptures out of context they will misunderstand them and they will use the word of god to deceive not to build up not for edification so we read here undeniably there's going to be many false prophets therefore many of these spiritual manifestations they are false but they're prevalent in the world. Look now to verse 2. He says, in this you know the Spirit of God. What does that mean? What he's going to reveal to us in a few moments, in that one can have discernment whether one is of the Spirit of God or of a different origin, an unclean, a demonic, a satanic origin. We should be able to discern and how do we do this look again he says in verse 2 in this you know the spirit of god every spirit who confesses messiah Yeshua, that is jesus christ in the flesh he has come now what he's speaking here is first of all that messiah has indeed come into the world if someone is saying i'm waiting for messiah to come i don't believe he's ever come we're waiting for him that person is not going to be of god he might say he loves god he might say he believes in god he might say that he's a servant of god he might say that he worships god but be assured this one is not of god so one to be in the position of of being of the spirit of god first and foremost he has to say yes messiah has already come yes he's coming back but he's come the first time what he did when he laid down his life nearly two thousand years ago 
on Passover, that suffering servant. So this is connected to an ability to discern what the prophets say concerning Messiah, what he's going to do the first time and what he's going to do when he returns the second time. And we look at this passage of Scripture once more. In this you know, the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses Messiah Yeshua in the flesh has come, from God he is. Now this also speaks about not just that he has come, but what he has done. And therefore also intrinsically related to what we've just studied is, is understanding the biblical Messiah. For example, Islam will say that, that, that Jesus has come but they don't have a biblical understanding, a scriptural understanding of who Messiah is. So it's just not, yes, Messiah has come, but, but tell me about this Messiah, who he is, what he's done, his character, what scripture that shows this. So when it says document the spirit, it means just not see if they're talking about Yeshua. Most false prophets speak about Yeshua. They will name the name Jesus. We've learned in another passage from the book of Matthew and also in parallel passages that deal with Yeshua's message that he taught, this Olivet Discourse. He speaks about the same thing. Many false prophets, many false teachers are going to go forth and they will say that Yeshua, that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. So much of where this false manifestation is coming is from those who name the name Yeshua. But it's not just naming his name. It's not just saying, I'm a believer. But it's being able to speak about his coming, meaning this, who he is. He's the divine son of God. And what he did. And why he did it. And what his expectations his commands are for his people. So this has many implications to it when it says, a true spirit of God. He confesses that Messiah Yeshua has come in the flesh. And then we read in verse 3, and every spirit who does not confess that Messiah Yeshua in the flesh has come, not from God, is he he's not from God if he doesn't understand and it's very significant that this this phrase in both occurrences that that confesses that Messiah has come in the flesh this phrase has come speaks about what he's done what he's doing and what he will do this phrase implies a understanding of the work of Messiah what he's about, his ministry in this world, how he's functioning, what he's up to. Very important term, very, very broad, but specific understanding of the coming of Messiah. And he says, also in verse 3, this one who denies, who does not confess, this one is not of God, and then look at the last part of verse 3. This gets very important. He says, also, this one is of the Antichrist. So if there's an individual and, and manifesting that which is supernatural, that which is, is out of the ordinary, that which does not have a scientific, a natural explanation, but this one does not understand who Messiah is, what he's come to do, what he has done and what he will do and what he's doing now. That one is not of God. Rather, we find, notice what he says. It says, and this one is of the Antichrist. And it says, whom you have heard that comes that's literally what it says whom you have heard that comes 
Now, people know that study the scripture, that there is an enemy on his way, the Antichrist. And what's so important here, and let's just read something. It says, as we continue on, and now in the world, he is already. Now, I translated this as literally as I could. Kai nun en to kosmoi estin ed. Which means, and now in the world, kosmo estin ed is already. This has serious implications. This tells us that the Antichrist is already in this world. Now, how is he ultimately going to be confirmed? Well, he's already in the world, but it doesn't mean that he has been revealed, that he has, has done anything that would allow us to know who he is. But, but in the days of John, John said, he's here presently. Now, some will say, this means his spirit, perhaps that's right. But, but as we get closer, there is going to be a greater manifestation of both the spirit of the Antichrist, this lawlessness, and the Antichrist himself. But John says, now, already, he is in the world. And what we're going to see is more and more of this Antichrist activity as we get more and more closer to the end of this age. Look now to verse 4. You are from God. What a good statement. You are from God, children. Now, some will say little children. It's simply a word that speaks about God's love for us, that he has great endearment for us, and that we are part of his family, that we share that same heritage. So he says, in a way of encouragement, you are from God, children, and notice this, you have overcome them, meaning what? The, the unclean spirits, these demonic uh, manifestations, the source of them, we are, and this word for, for overcoming, it's in the perfect meaning, we have, we are, and we will. It speaks about ultimately a total victory. But it's very important that it has this idea of overcoming. Victory does not mean there's no opponent. Victory implies that you defeat that opponent, that enemy. And God is promising, and the implication is this. The moment that we believed, we have that victory. We still have it, and we will forever have it. This is good news. So he says, children, also you have overcome them. Now, don't get prideful. Why are we victorious? Why do we have that promise? He says, because greater is the one in you. It's not me, but it's him in me because I've entered into that covenant with him. And he's speaking here about God himself through the, the person of the Holy Spirit. It says that greater is he which is in you, whom is in you than the one in the world. So he, the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one presently in this world. Verse 5. He says, Those that are in the world or of the world were what? Those that are from the world. The implication is what he said earlier. We are greater because of the one in us. We're going to be victorious because we share in, in this victory. 
because the great one is in us. On account of this, notice what he says, on account of this, from the world they speak. Those that are from the world, it says, they speak according to the world, and the world hears them. So those who are part of the world, they're going to speak the world's language. I'm talking about the world's desires, what the world likes, what the world agrees with, the perspective of the world. Today, there is much propaganda in this world. And one of the greatest sources of it is the media, just that simple. And the world loves this propaganda. It speaks to the very heart of their origin. Why? Because if you were to ask me, who is the one that is controlling much of what we see? Not all, but much of what we see in the media. You know, journalism, for example. Journalism used to be about truth. One of the things that a true journalist would do would simply be to put forth the facts. But now that, that's changed. You are seeing the vast majority of schools of journalism saying, we're, we're not about truth, we're not about facts, we are advocates for our positions. That's what journalism has become, an advocate for the ways of the world. And this has great relevance to what we see in this passage once more. He writes here that we have overcome them because the one in us is greater than the one in the world. On account of this, he says, those that are from the world, on account of this, from the world, they speak. And the world hears them. But here in the next verse, look at verse 6. We are from God. A totally different origin. Let me say that differently. A totally different foundation. We are established in a different way. We are established through God giving us life. And he's going to talk about that in a moment. But look again, verse 6. We are from God. The one who knows God hears us. Now notice the difference. The ones of the world, they listen to those that are of false prophets, those things that are of unclean spirits. They, they embrace the things of the world. They listen to that. But we and those who belong to God, those who belong to God, they're going to listen, it says, to us. Verse 6, second half. Who is not of God does not hear us. Just that simple. Now, now don't beat your head against the, the wall because people reject the truth that you give them. They belong to the world and they are not seeking truth. They are not interested in God. They are not born of God. They have no connection. And therefore, they are not going to hear, listen, respond, embrace the things that we say. And he goes on to write about this. It says, they are not of God and they do not listen. One who is of the world does not listen to us. From this we know, and I like this passage, from this we know, the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception, the spirit of air. Now, now we're getting someplace because it says this. Although there are many different spirits, we can put them into two and only two categories. The spirits that belong to truth and the spirits that belong to, to deceit, to lie. So every spirit of truth is of the Holy Spirit. Every manifestation of the Spirit is going to be rooted in truth. But every manifestation of, of an unclean spirit, of the enemy, connected to the Antichrist, and don't miss that the Antichrist 
in this passage is going to be supported by all of these false prophets. And here again, false spiritual manifestations are going to be rampant as we get closer and closer and into the last days. Why? Well, just read sometimes from from Revelation chapter 13, where it speaks about the work of the Antichrist and a false prophet who is going to do many signs and wonders, cause that which is is unexplainable by, by nature, supernatural, but it's not of God. And that's why he says here, It is incumbent upon us that we understand the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. There's one origin. Many different spiritual manifestations, but they will come, all will come from two sources. Either the spirit of truth or the spirit of air, the spirit of deceit. So ask yourself a very important question, and that's this. Who is leading me? Who am I listening to? Am I being led by the spirit of truth? Now, we know in John's gospel, same John, but in John's gospel, he speaks about the Holy Spirit, that comforter, that that advocate that we have, and he speaks about him being a spirit of truth and that he will lead us into all truth, into righteousness. That passage is so wonderful because it puts a connection between truth and righteousness. And we see here the spirit of deceit is going to lead us to error and unrighteousness. What's unrighteousness? It is a spirit which is against the law. That's why the Antichrist, one of the ways that he's spoken of is as the man of lawlessness. Let's move now to to verse 7. He says again, beloved ones, we should love one another. Now, this is a a Torah manifestation. Why? Well, what is, and Paul says this in Galatians, he says all the Torah in, in, in a word, in a statement. And what is that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he's saying here here to true believers, beloved ones, he writes, beloved ones, we should love one another because love. And it really says the love. Why? It's talking about a specific love. Not all what the world thinks is love, what other people define as love, but true love. It says the love from God it is. And everyone who is loving, very important, a participle appears here. Now, a participle is a combination between a verb and an adjective. It describes an activity which describes the one who does it. It characterizes the one who does it. So that's why suddenly a, a, a participle appears here where he says, and everyone who loves, that's his description, he demonstrates love. This one, from God, and pay attention to this, has been born, has been born from God. Now, when we are born from God, we are going to walk, we are going to to demonstrate the love of God in our life. We've received it and we're going to manifest it. That's what a true believer does. And the Holy Spirit, he's in our life to assist us doing that. And that manifestation of love through the Holy Spirit is always going to be that which is biblically sound, that which the scripture tells us to do. And it's going to be in agreement with the laws of God, the commandments of God. So he says, everyone who is loving, from God, he has been born, which means you can't love in a way that God is, is, is agreeing with, that he approves us, unless you've been born, again, born by him. And the same one knows God. But look now to verse, verse 8. The one who is not loving has not known God. And this implies, this implies He's never known anything 
about God. He may know that there is a God, but he doesn't know God. He hasn't experienced God. He does not have the right definition of God. So the one who is not loving does not know God because God is love. We can always see whether one has been born again because the love of God is going to be manifested through him. Now, what happens is this. There is great deception because of this word love. Because people hear love and they think of what love means to them how they define it, what they think is a a manifestation of love. But there is a big difference between the love of God and the definition of love for this world. Love, and I'm going to say what I say so frequently, the only way that you can discern the love of God is through the commandments of God. Did you hear that? Very important. We are taught, Messiah taught us, what is the greatest commandment love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and very essence and the second commandment meaning the second great commandment is like the first love your neighbor as yourself what does it have in common love love god love your neighbor so love is seen in the torah in the commandments if you're not studying the commandments you will not have an accurate definition of love you will not know what you're called to do how you're called to behave and that's why he says the one who is not loving has not known god because god is love verse 9 in this in this what he says in this the love of god is manifested in us through us is how it can be understood because we know the love of God we've experienced we are going to make manifest the love of God that's what we're called to do and he says in this the love of God has been manifested in us that his only begotten son very important only begotten son now I hear a lot of time where people will say well we're all the children of god or there was a a very well-known movie back i believe in the the late 70s and it spoke about uh, god and and an actor by the name of george burns many years he's passed away but he played god and as he was was playing god in this movie He says, oh, Buddha was my son, Muhammad was my son, all these, meaning there's nothing unique about Yeshua. And this teaches us something very profound. The world is not going to understand the uniqueness, the distinct son of God, the only begotten son. And that's why we see this phrase here where it says, because his only begotten son, God has sent into the world god did not send buddha god did not send muhammad he did not send any other one there is only one son of god the only begotten son of god and he is going to demonstrate love how by never sinning by embracing toward truth that's what you see now this may be very foreign to many believers But one of the reasons why the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of of the law, so to speak, why they wanted to entrap Yeshua, why they wanted to say he was a sinner, is because if he sinned, this would disqualify him from being the Messiah. But you know what we see in the Gospels? He never, ever sinned. Let me say it in a different way. He never, ever, ever sinned violated the law he was the law in the flesh that's what the same john tells us in his gospel in chapter one when it speaks about the word becoming flesh what word the word of god and therefore messiah perfectly express the righteousness in the law 
because he loved perfectly. And that's why the Antichrist he is spoken of. Just check out what Messiah says, what Paul says about the Antichrist. They call him the son of lawlessness or the man of lawlessness. Why is that important? Because he's against the law. He does not express the character of the Torah. He's against that, meaning he's against love. So when we talk about Messiah having come in the flesh, how are we going to understand him? That he perfectly lived love, never violating any of the commandments of God. And notice how we're going to conclude this study today. He says that the Son, his only begotten Son, God sent into the world in order that and this is huge, in order that we should live through him, that is, by means of him, because of him. But what's the emphasis? What does it say? That God sent his only begotten son into this world so that through him we should live. What does that tell me? It tells me this, that God is, is commanding me to live in a very specific way. Not just any way, but a way that expresses his love, that is, expresses his commandments, his expectations for me. How I will have discernment, how I will understand what is truth and what is deception. Are you living through him? Are you doing the things that, that he would have you to do, that he wants to empower you to do, that he has given you his spirit to perform? This is what John is admonishing us to do. Well, we're going to stop at this time, but we'll continue next week when we conclude chapter 4, and we'll see how important what we've studied thus far in this chapter how important it is for rightly understanding what John's going to say in this second half of chapter 4. Until then, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>